I, I came from industry before coming to York, and I think the one thing I'll never get used to is are those long, pretentious introductions. So, <clears throat> but thank you. It was very kind, and it was not a comment on the introduction, more my comfort level with them. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about a space mission that's currently going on. So it launched last September. And, and um, Canada's participation in these planetary science missions is fairly recent. Uh, so this is really our fourth contribution to, uh, to planetary science missions. And this one's on a NASA mission. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the objectives and a bit about that mission. Before I get going, so my position on this mission is, is I develop the concept for the instrument, and I lead the uh, Canadian science team, and I have some leadership on the broader NASA mission. But I really should acknowledge that you can't do one of these things alone. There's really a broad team. We have industry counterparts that have uh, done a lot of the engineering of, of these instruments. So that's McDonald, Detweiler, and, and Optech, which is very close here. And then, um, of course, we're funded by the Canadian government through the Canadian Space Agency. So we always have to thank them. And then there are other science uh, contributors, both in Canada at, at UBC, University of Winnipeg, University of Calgary, University of Toronto, and, uh, and as well um, our many colleagues in the United States and, and even further abroad than that. So, um, so I'm the, the mouthpiece here, um, but uh, these missions really take many, many people. So here's the outline of the talk. I'm going to tell you about the mission. So the mission's called OSIRIS-REx, uh, why we chose a particular asteroid, which has the odd name Bennu, uh, that the mission is targeting, and then a little bit about the instrument itself. So all space missions have to have an ac a name that has an acronym. So OSIRIS-REx is no different. Um, so the, the objectives, the science objectives of the mission are contained within, within the name itself. So it's origins, spectral interpretation, resource identification, security, regolith explorer. And I'll elaborate a little bit more on each of these areas um, during the talk. Uh, it's, it's, it's an odd thing about space that acronyms are very, very important. In fact, I remember one of my very first uh, meetings when I started working in space and I sat through a meeting and I had no clue what was going on because it was acronym after acronym after acronym. So, so I'll try and uh, define all the acronyms, but if I miss one, put your hand up, say, what is that? And I'll, I'll happily uh, uh, define it for you. Okay, so, so this was the exciting day. So, um, it was discussed, there was a launch party here at Lassonde. I, I wasn't there because I was actually down watching this happen. So on September 8th, um, we launched this mission on an Atlas 411. It's always very cool. If you've never seen a rocket launch, uh, please take the opportunity. Um, it's just hard to describe because you see this thing going up and then this wall of sound washes over you. Um, it's definitely uh, worth worthwhile. So. Our target for this uh, mission is a, a, what's termed a small body, so a small asteroid. And this asteroid has the name of Bennu. It was uh, named by a student in a competition, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you about that in a little bit, why it's called Bennu. It's an odd name after an Egyptian god. And so right now what's happening with the mission is our spacecraft, um, so it's a little, little dark maybe, um, is really playing catch up with Bennu. So um, we're gonna catch up with Bennu about a year from now, a little, little longer than a year from now, and then we're gonna start um, seeing up close um, this target we've chosen. So what are the science goals? So another way of talking about those, the acronym goals, our number one thing that we wanna do here is we wanna go out and grab a sample from the asteroid and we wanna bring it back because even though these instruments on these spacecraft are very capable. They're not as capable as, as instruments we can have in the laboratory. And so if we, if we uh, dropped all goals of the mission, this is the one we would prioritize, which is to bring back a, a sample, and it's coming back in 2023. In terms of understanding where that sample came from, it's really important to characterize the asteroid and, uh, and not just the asteroid, but the sample site, exactly where we got the sample from on the asteroid. Um, 
These are, uh, seems I have a formatting issue too on my slide, sorry about that. Um, one of the really important things about um, one, of, one of these missions where we can go out and grab a sample is, along with the sample being very pristine and not being subjected to any weathering processes on Earth, we know exactly where that sample came from. So we have other samples from, from asteroids and from other planets, and these are, come in the form of meteorites. But those meteorites, you know, we have to kind of guess where they came from, maybe what asteroid family, which planet, and we do that by understanding the mineral makeup and, and some other um, details of the asteroid. But usually they sit around on the Earth and they, and they uh, you know, they weather and, and if there's iron in it, it rusts and all those processes you're, you're used to. So we don't really have a pristine sample to look at. Uh, the other thing is, uh, it's just a guess. It's not just a guess which body, it, it's, what we understand here with this mission is not just which body it came from, but where on that body. So we can understand some of the more detailed geological processes. We don't get that with meteorites. And then this is um, a chance where we can go out and we can understand in detail this particular asteroid. And we have Earth observations of this asteroid and knowledge of the asteroid will let us to better infer what other asteroids are that we can't go and visit, but that we have ground-based telescope operation, observations of. And then the measure orbit deviations, that requires maybe a little bit more explanation. So here's the timeline. So October next year, uh, we're going to start getting close enough to Bennu to actually start using these instruments in earnest. We're going to spend the 505 days around Bennu um, between five kilometers down to, well, I've got 700 meters here, but really 500 meters and below now are the, the latest numbers until we can understand where the safe spot is and the, the spot with the highest science value and probability of successfully grabbing a sample. And we're going to zip down, touch the asteroid for a short period of time and bring the sample back and <clears throat> get out of Dodge and get back to Earth. So the mission goal is 60 grams. Doesn't sound like a lot of sample, but actually 60 grams is enough to accomplish all our science goals and to put most of the sample away for future generations um, as we develop new instruments. We actually hope that we get something more on the order of a kilogram. So um, if we do, we'll have, we'll have uh, plenty of sample. That sample comes back in 2023. Um, comes back in a capsule that lands in, uh, in Utah and gets picked up, picked up there. Samples go back to NASA Johnson in Houston. And actually, because of Canada's contribution, we get a, a portion of that sample back. And that'll really be our country's first uh, pristine sample from space from another planetary body that, that we have access to. So here's what the spacecraft looks like. I'm having a formatting issue on my slides from the transfer, I think. Um, so it's about two meters on each side. It's solar powered. Uh, I'll show you a real picture of this. Um, this is the communications antenna. And this long thing is a sampling device. And so I mentioned that the asteroid was called Bennu. And it was called Bennu because, by the way, we started late. What is my timeline for this talk? Okay, that includes the question period. Yes. Yeah. All right, perfect. Um, so, so there was a student competition, and there's an Egyptian god that kind of looks like a, a flamingo, you know, with long legs. And the student thought that the spacecraft, because of this long sampling device, you know, and, and the solar arrays looked like this bird. And so, um, although its spacecraft transferred to the asteroid, the asteroid got named after this Egyptian bird. Um, and it's called Bennu. So here's a picture of the actual spacecraft. So it gives you an idea of the size and the complexity. Um, so just a, so this is the big communications antenna. This is the sample return capsule, and this is the science deck. And the can we do something with the lights here, um, or 
If we can turn some of them down at the front, it might, just the contrast looks a little poor. Um, so all the science instruments sit on the science deck as well as that long arm. And what I was really struggling with here is the laser altimeter that uh, Canada is providing and that I'm responsible for. I'll show you uh, another picture that's a little, uh, little clearer. <clears throat> Let's talk individually about the science goals. So, as I said, this is the number one goal. We want 60 grams of sample back. Um, that 60 grams will be use, used to look for organics and look at the mineralogical makeup and look at the physical processes associated with creating the, the small um, particles. And that will all be able to be put into context about where on the asteroid it came from, and this helps us to understand the overall um, origin and evolution of, of the asteroid. The sampling device itself, at least the sampling device head, so we're talking about something that's about, about that big, it's called the touch and go sampler. And touch and go, so we never talk about landing when it comes to this, because people think of landing as a very, um, Dangerous process, you know, the Mars landings happens very quickly, uh, really highly um, uh, risky. This is more akin to if you've ever watched the space shuttle dock with the space station, you know, the microgravity environment of this uh, asteroid, it's a, it's a very slow process. We're only going to touch with just that sampling head for a few seconds, and then we're going to leave again. This is how it works. It's actually like a re reverse vacuum cleaner. So there's no air, so we can't just uh, suck up the air in some of the regolith. Um, what we do is we have some nitrogen bottles, and at, when some micro switches touch the surface, we blow the nitrogen bottles, and it, the nitrogen comes down and blows regolith up into this um, sampling container. So regolith are the loose particles on top of, a, of an asteroid or another planetary body. So it, one of the reasons why we spend so long around the asteroid is we want to pick portions of the asteroid where there are lots of fine material. And by fine material, I mean you know, a couple of centimeters on down, because those are the sizes that we can actually successfully collect. So our Earth-based testing suggests that a kilogram is, is likely. Um, this is a movie, I think. So just to give you a little overall context of the mission better than I can do verbally. So here's the spacecraft starting to approach. So this is after our, most of our 500 days where we really understand where we want to select and, and sample from. And that's all it is, it's really, this is sped up a little bit. You can think about that as a five second item. What we're doing here is we're actually nodding the spacecraft back and forth to measure the little bit of extra, you know, this 60 grams or kilogram of sample. It changes the, the uh, moment of inertia of the spacecraft so we can actually sense that extra mass up there. Um, we're going to do a little bit of visual inspection to make sure we have a sample. And if we have a sample, um, we're going to stow it and then, and then leave. If we don't have a sample, we have the opportunity to do this a couple of more times. Um, but that would be a, a non-ideal situation for sure. Coming back to Earth now, and there goes the sample return capsule um, down to, to land in the Utah test and tracking range, I think it is, UTTR. Okay, so that's kind of the end goal. Here's some of the goals that are leading up to it, we want to create maps of the asteroid. This is, again, to understand the context of the sample and to understand about the asteroid itself and to better understand about other asteroids. So um, we have a numerous map types. We have spectral maps, so how does light change and its, how does the material change the reflectance of light as a function of the color of light or the wavelength of light? Uh, we have camera systems, so we're going to do image maps. Um, we have some, some ability with the different types of spectrometers to do elemental maps to understand where the, uh, whether there are any differences between the, 
the mineralogical and elemental distribution across the asteroid, and topographic maps, and we'll come back to topographic maps. So here's the science deck. So you, hopefully the picture I showed you, um, you can remember what the actual spacecraft looked like. But I wanted to, this gives me a good chance to talk about the different science instruments. So here's us, the OSIRIS-REx laser altimeter. Um, this is the sampling device, the TAG-SAM. And then we've got two spectrometers. So OTES is a thermal emission spectrometer. So into the far infrared looks at heat signatures more than what we think of as light. Um, and then the visible and infrared spectrometer. So together these will give us information on, on minerals and, um, and some thermal information that will help us select the sampling sites. And then we have a, a set of uh, cameras. So these cameras are University of Arizona, uh, designed and built. Thermal emission spectrometer, that's uh, Arizona State University. The visible and inf infrared spectrometer, that's Goddard Space Science. Uh, sorry, NASA Goddard. Um, and this is, uh, and of course, this is the Canadian contribution. And then there's one other uh, instrument which is kind of interesting. It's a it's a coded aperture X-ray spectrometer for looking at these elemental abundances. And that was a student project. So it's not really one of the main instruments on the mission, but we're looking forward to getting the data. It's an MIT Harvard student project. So I think we'll, in the interest of time um, and leaving some questions, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over these. But um, I'll, I'll stop just a minute so you can get a look at the real hardware that's on the spacecraft. Uh, in general, with space missions, if you see anything red, it's going to come off before flight. Um, here's the camera system. So the, the reason for the three different cameras, Polycam is like the long distance camera or the high resolution camera. It has a very narrow field of view, so you can think of it more like a telescope. And these other two, um, so MapCam has a wider field and it's going to be used for the the rougher maps over the surface of the asteroid, and then SAMCAM is the one being used to uh, look at the sample site and, and make sure that we have a sample. So how are we going to document the sample site? So again, this is sample context. Um, we really need to document it from the largest scales of the asteroid down to really down to a few millimeters because we 20 millimeters or a little more is really the limit of our ability to pick the regolith up and bring it back. So if we actually try and sample on a space where there isn't a, a large amount of that size of um, regolith, we're going to be unsuccessful with our sampling. We also have this, in terms of the sample site size, it's really an area of about a 25 meter circle. And we refer to these as sampling ellipses, or um, with other missions, it's error ellipses. And that's because we have some uncertainty in exactly where we're going to pick up a sample. And this just has to do with the uncertainty of navigating the spacecraft um, around an asteroid. So we could be really be anywhere within that 25 meter circle. So not only do we have to make sure that anywhere in there there's regolith, we have to make sure there are no large boulders and rocks and obstructions because that could uh, damage the spacecraft. So here's our other, um, here's the security in OSIRIS-REx. So this is the one that, you know, is always useful to sell to the government. So, you know, asteroids have hit us in the past and they will hit us in the future. So this doesn't really keep me up uh, late because the probabilities are very small for all of the, the ones that we know about. But we really are the first generation that could prevent, you know, that has the technology to, to understand, um, detect early enough, and then do something about a major collision. So in order to do that, we really have to understand the, the diversity of the asteroid population. Because if you were trying to move an asteroid you know, how it's the, the, whether it's a, you know, a single unified body or a rubble pile that's just held together by microgravity, these things matter. So for Bennu, Bennu is one of these asteroids that's a near-Earth asteroid. I'll show you 
what we mean by that in the in the uh, future. And this chart may be a little out of date, but the numbers don't change too much. So you can you can go to um, JPL's site and see this for any asteroid that's at least any near Earth asteroid. So it shows you, for example, that Bennu is about a 500 meter in diameter asteroid. Tells you that it's got a cumulative probability uh, impact of, of uh, so what is that, 0.03% um, over the next 200 years. So although this is a low probability of hitting us, it's certainly not non-zero. And it's, um, this is actually one of the most probable ones that we know of, uh, of impacting us over the next 200 years. So that's one of the reasons why we chose Bennu. So here's why it's a problem. Um, these near-Earth asteroids, so here's the Earth's orbit, this white ring here, and here's Bennu's orbit. So you can see that it crosses Earth's orbit, and that's what gives us the, the opportunity to um, have, a, have a collision. Luckily, this oddly named asteroid will not have a collision because it lives in the asteroid belt. So I'm really happy not to be the cause of you know, the destruction of the human uh, race. So the question is, you know, why, given all our technology, why do, these, why do we just have a probability of impact? Why can we not figure out exactly what the orbits are going to be, do better and better measurements? And why can't we say there will or there won't be an impact? One of the reasons is that asteroids are just small. And because they're small, they're pushed around by lots of different um, forces. And so one of the, the forces, that one of the things we're gonna measure and model is what's called the Yarkovsky effect. So obviously a, a, a Russian uh, um, sorted this out in the, in the first place. So it's a little hard to explain, but think about a rotating asteroid and the sun is heating up the surface of the asteroid, so um, the hottest spot would be just as, so if you think about a, a point on the asteroid starting to come out of night into daytime, starting to heat up, and somewhere over here as it starts to go into nighttime again, it's at its hottest because it's been sitting in the sunlight all day. Then it starts cooling off uh, as it rotates around the, the backside. So wherever the asteroid is hottest, it's gonna be radiating into deep space more and more photons than it would where it's cooler. So there's a, there's a differential photon pressure here, just, just light radiating back into space. That light has a momentum associated with it. And that force, you can think about a force on a 500 meter asteroid, something on the order of you know, the same force as if I put three grapes on the table here. So it's not very much, but it's 24 seven for years. And the ability to predict what that force is, which is significant enough to move the asteroid around um, and muck up our, our predictions, depends on a lot of things. It depends on the orbit of the asteroid itself. It depends on the rotation rate. Depends whether there's any wobble in the pole of the asteroid, which can happen in these small bodies at, at fairly quick rates. Depends on the surface shape, and it depends on the optical properties, how the, the light is radiated off or reflected off. So all of these things matter, and it's very complicated. And this is significant not just for um, the security of the earth, not just for, that doesn't sound, it's very important the security of the earth, um, but it's also important uh, both to understand where these asteroids came from from a science perspective and, and how these near earth asteroids populate these dangerous orbits. And so, um, sorry, this is maybe the uh, most um, science laden or detailed um, portion of the talk. So if you're not used to looking at some of these graphs, so this is the, in essence, the distance from the, the sun. So two AUs is twice the Earth's distance from the sun. And this is the asteroid belt. So this is a histogram. So the high peaks are lots of asteroids in this particular uh, orbit from the sun. And then you'll see there are these gaps. 
And so one of the, the, the main hypothesis about how we get some of these near-Earth asteroids <coughs> is that forces like the Yarkovsky effect move some of these asteroids into these areas where there are gaps. And these gaps are resonances with the major planets, primarily Jupiter. And so you can think about a resonance like on a swing set. You know, you're pushing your kid and you give a little push and it comes back and just in the right time you give another little push. Well, these orbits do the same kind of thing and those pushes can get big enough to move these asteroids right out of the asteroid belt and into potential collision with the Earth. So it's an important phenomenon um, to understand better than we currently do. Okay, so we talked a little bit about um, telescope observations. I'm going to have to speed it up here a little bit. Um, so a number of ways asteroids are characterized. They're characterized by orbits, so whether they're Earth-crossing asteroids or they live within the uh, orbit of the Earth or they're in the asteroid belt or they cross... Um, they don't quite cross the orbit of the Earth, they have different names. So this is one of our classifications. The other way we classify asteroids, and this is predominantly the way we do it, is by how the asteroids reflect light. This is just because we look at them with telescopes. This is our easy method of doing it. So in this particular case um, of asteroid Bennu, as the light gets a little more red, the asteroid reflects less. As the light is more blue, the asteroid reflects more, and we have a pretty flat, featureless spectrum. And this is the kind of asteroid we're going to. So this is uh, just a detail of how we characterize asteroids. So let's talk about why we chose Bennu in particular. So Bennu, as I said, is about a 500 meter diameter uh, object. Its day is about 4.3 hours, so 4.3 hours for every rotation. This is a radar shape model. So this was developed using primarily the Arecibo radar. It's about a 20 meter or so um, resolution. So this is our best guess as to what Bennu looks like. You can see there are, there's a fairly pronounced equatorial ridge here. So the pole is in this direction. <coughs> this is all we currently know. So when you see pictures in the newspaper in a couple of years of what Bennu actually looks like, you'll you'll be able to see how close to right we were. So from 500,000 asteroids, how did we choose Bennu? Well, only 9,000 of those asteroids we know of that are these near-Earth asteroids that, are, um, that have a security concern for the Earth. Um, only 350 of those 9,000 have orbits that are easy to get to. Easy is a relative term in space, but um, we have to get to them, but we also want to bring the sample back. So the harder it is, the more fuel, the more time, the more resources it's going to take. So now we're down to 350. 29 of them have diameters greater than 200 meters. Well, why does that matter? If you have a very small body with even less gravity than Bennu, it's very hard to navigate a spacecraft around it. So we do have uh, very rough orbits that are capable around Bennu, and those get to be difficult if the body is too small, has too low a mass, and therefore too low a gravity. Five are carbonaceous. So these are the types that we know least about, especially these B types. If, if you go back to the spectroscopy, all those squiggly lines, the, this was a B type. And carbonaceous asteroids are important because we want to better understand um, organic contents, which could have import, been important for how um, life formed on Earth. We want to understand the water content um, and that are, that are a portion of those because there are still questions about how Earth got all its water back after you know, it was very hot in its initial formations. So carbonaceous asteroids were really um, the goal. And so out of those five, um, we chose Bennu. So from 500,000 to five pretty rapidly. All right, so now we're going to talk about the instrument uh, that I spend most of my time working on. So it's an altimeter. What do we mean by an altimeter? Well, very simply, you know, if my pointer is the spacecraft, then an altimeter can measure the distance from the, my pointer to the floor. And it does that by sending out a laser pulse, really accurately timing when we sent the laser pulse out. 
and then really accurately timing when the reflected pulse comes back. So in concept, it's very simple to get the kind of performance uh, we have with this instrument. It's very much more complex. So I'm not going to talk about these in detail, but the reddish lines give you uh, the, the Coles notes. Do we still have Coles notes versions of how the um, uh, of what the science goals are, but effectively we're going to, to very accurately determine the shape of the asteroid. This is at the whole asteroid scale and also at the sample site scale. So our laser measurements are anywhere from spots on the surfaces of a couple of meters right down to um, approaching a couple of centimeters. So this instrument has some heritage from some previous missions. Um, so these were done by my uh, colleagues at MDA and OPTEC. So um, there was a US Air Force mission that was on an experimental satellite that had a scanning LIDAR. So not only do you just point and shoot, but the instrument can point itself and shoot and scan and, and take what's more like a range picture than a single range. And then we had the first instruments that we um, sent to another planet, the Phoenix LiDAR that was on the Mars instrument. So this is a project I started when I was in industry and I led the, the I was the, the engineering lead for, for this project until we landed them on the surface of Mars. This is the one that um, discovered it snowing for the first time on Mars. So we sn saw snow start at uh, some 10-ish uh, kilometers from the surface and really go all the way to the to the surface. So this was a good Canadian uh, discovery and the, the science team was actually led by a colleague of mine here at York. So another York uh, space first. So we had kind of a low energy near uh, range um, LIDAR that had scanning capability and then we had uh, a higher energy laser here that um, allowed for uh, further, range, further distances and, and still getting measurements. So we combine both of these into the OSIRIS-REx laser altimeter. So in terms of size, you can think about the two proverbial bread boxes here. Um, so we've got predominantly an electronics box here, predominantly an optical box, but of course there are some electronics. So this is the window, so the laser beam comes out and the reflected beam comes back and is measured through the same window. Some of these components that I was talking about, so we've got the high energy laser that's very similar to the laser that was, that's currently, I guess, still sitting on the surface of Mars, uh, non-functional now. Um, and then we have a, a low energy laser. So this one is for the far distances, this one is for the near distances. This is uh, with the lid off, um, looking down, so if you, <laughs> Take that gold mirror, that window would be right above that mirror. So um, we send the laser beams through this, through a couple of holes in this mirror, off this, straight out of the page to the target. The reflected light comes back in off this mirror, off this mirror to a detector that's over in this area. And this Mirror here is one of the key things that makes Ola unique because it's a very fast two axis scanning mirror and that gives Ola the ability to, to point itself. So why is that important? <clears throat> well, there are other laser altimeters that, for instance, have been around the Earth or been around the Moon, been around um, Mars. And these all either with you know, a single spot or a couple of maybe up to five spots for the lunar orbiter laser altimeter. They just let the spacecraft do its pointing and they, they keep merrily uh, doing their measurements, usually at, on an order of something like 10 measurements per second. OLA's two lasers, well, the one that operates at a distance operates at 100 times a second, so we get 100 measurements a second. The, the low energy one that operates when we're in below a kilometer or so operates at 10,000 measurements per second. So the other thing to remember is that, you know, if you're orbiting around the Earth, you're orbit orbiting at something like seven kilometers per second. So seven kilometers per second, you know, at 10 measurements per second, we have lots and lots of distance between each measurement. If we were going to try that same kind of approach at, you know, 10,000 measurements per second around an asteroid, well, 
the, the ground track velocities around these asteroids are more like 20 centimeters per second. So we would have lots of spots kind of redundantly on top of one another in, in a very dense line. We'd have some number of lines around the asteroid, um, but we wouldn't get full coverage of the asteroid and we'd have kind of a lot of wasted data and data is expensive to get back from spacecraft because the communication with spacecraft um, is very limited. So whenever you take data, you want to really uh, make it useful and be able to use it. So this is really what makes this unique for one of these small body missions. And so here are the, the phases and how we use this mirror. The mirror is also very tailorable. So we start when we're about seven kilometers out from the asteroid and we take our initial look at the asteroid with cameras and, and we're helping both the navigation of the spacecraft and we're helping to um, to uh, um, scale the asteroid. And we're gonna use the asteroid, or we're gonna use spacecraft motion, we're just gonna scan back and forth. We do the same thing in detailed survey phase, but this is, we're sitting across, we're sitting uh, equatorially with the asteroid. The asteroid's rotating under us, so it's rotating in this direction. We're scanning in this direction, and the spacecraft is nodding up and down. So we essentially get overlapping scans as the asteroid moves around underneath us. Then in our, I'll, I won't talk about this phase because it's very similar to the other phases, but here's our main phase where we're gonna get global coverage. So over this whole asteroid, we expect to get seven centimeter resolution. This is you know, on the order of a billion measurements on this asteroid. Um, and we do it by Someone help me, by the way, after this, because uh, all, all, all you people that are uh, cl close to my age are going to get this, and all the young people won't. But it's kind of like an old cathode ray tube TV. You know, you, you scan, and you scan back and back, and, and we build up over, you know, two or three or four minutes uh, a range picture. And over that time, the asteroid hasn't moved very much, the spacecraft hasn't moved very much, although we do correct for those motions. Um, so that, that's really, we could not do that if we didn't have, we wouldn't get full coverage in our allotted times without that capability. So it's really what makes OLA unique. The, the high measurement rate, which is possible by the fairly uh, you know, modest differences in range. So we're talking seven kilometers on down, not 70 or 700 kilometers. Um, and then the, the dexterous scanning mirror. So I just want to give you a sense of, um, and I'll try and wrap this up quickly, a sense of the capabilities. So uh, this is actually the physical stack at York, and there's a student residence in behind it. So we did this measurement from, um, well, it's about 900 meters to the stack and about 1,200 meters to the um, student residence. And so th this is what one of those scans looked like. Now, all this... Um, this is actually all this, what looks like noise here, that's actually real measurements from dust particles. Um, actually, if we get dust particles like that around Bennu, we'll be very excited from a science perspective, but we don't expect it. So we would get a very much uh, cleaner image. But it gives you a sense of, of the power of this um, scanning mirror to, to build a range picture. So here's a close up of the stack. So um, we saw this and we thought, oh, what is that? And we had no idea. So I sent one of my postdocs out to get a closer look. And uh, it turns out that it's a security camera on the stack. And so <laughs> we can blow this up a little bit. So remember, we've taken this from 900 meters and there's, there's smearing because at 900 meters, our, our spot size is um, about nine centimeters or a little bigger than that. Um, but it gives you a sense of the power of being able to, to measure the topography that we're going to have on this, uh, on this. I'm going to skip over this a little bit because I, I want to finish up by really giving you a sense of why the shape of asteroids are important. So we think about, you know, on Earth, we, we're used to looking at flat maps. Flat maps are very difficult to interpret on these small bodies, both because, you know, the curvature and the changes happen so quickly. But if you don't have a good shape and you don't understand the spin, you get a very different sense of what's going on and how to interpret the processes on this um, asteroid. So if you just think about this in terms of shape and the way we're used to thinking about the Earth, 
Uh, you know, we've got high spots here at the poles, and we've got high spots here at the equators, and the low spots are in the mid-latitudes. That's not what's going on here. What's going on is if you put a marble on the poles, that marble would roll right to the equator. So even though the equator is further away from the um, center of the asteroid, that's actually the low spots of the asteroid are right here on the equator. And, and it's really because the gravitational uh, forces and the rotational forces are of the same magnitude. So um, the asteroid's spinning like this, and those rotational forces lessen uh, gravity um, at the equator. So if you were on a diet, you would want to stand here and uh, get on the scale. So, so we need you know, really good modeling of the asteroid dynamics. We really need good modeling of the, modeling of the shape um, to understand that really uh, flow of material is from the poles to the equator. And you know, the equator then is the likely place where we will be able to sample um, regolith for, for our return home of our sample. And maybe I'll stop there and just give you a chance to ask some questions.